Good morning. Welcome everyone in the name of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, our King, and as our theme is this weekend, our hope. What a blessing that God has given us that we can gather once again like this in the presence of our amazing God. And sometimes we say, we ask God, we invite him into our presence, but it's the other way around. I believe he's inviting us into his presence And we are truly blessed as his children that we can gather like this, knowing he wants to meet with us. He wants to bless us and speak to us. And when we get to be together with so many believers in the Lord, it's kind of like a little foretaste of heaven already. And it truly is a joy. We're so thrilled that you're here. We welcome you. Uh, To those watching on live stream, we also want to welcome you and pray that you would also be greatly blessed and encouraged today as you watch the services If you are here for the first time and you are local, you're from Edmonton, please make sure to visit the Welcome Center in the foyer as we have a special appreciation gift for you. Yesterday, we were already so encouraged by the many songs and the testimony and the messages we heard about how we have this confident hope and he has a name. His name is Jesus. And how this hope in Jesus is the anchor of our soul. That no matter what we go through, we can have this hope that brings us through, that gives us new joy and motivation. And our prayer is that, once again, God would greatly bless us and encourage us, strengthen our faith today as we worship Him. And we want to worship Him in many ways, through listening to His Word, through His Scripture, through hearing testimonies, and spending time together in fellowship But we also want to spend time this morning worshiping our Savior and Lord together in song. And we're going to begin by singing two songs together. The first is a song, We Come, O Lord, with joyful hearts. And I think we can agree. We're joyful, we're thankful, and we want to give Him honor and glory. So let's sing together. If you want to follow along the hymnal, it's song number 22. We Come, O Lord, with joyful hearts. second song we're going to sing is we bring the sacrifice of praise and this song we'll find in the worship duotang that you can find uh, in your benches as well and of course the words will be up on the screen as well 
number 48. Some announcements to share with you this morning, and I would like to ask you to refer to your bulletin to find all the information about the worship services and events at this church conference today. I just want to encourage you to also hold on to the bulletin, as each service it will be the same one that gets handed out. Um, if there's anything that is not in the bulletin that you have a question about, our volunteers at the Welcome Center in the foyer would be happy to assist you. If you require childcare during the worship services this morning and this afternoon for children aged five and under, please register at this Welcome Center. Just prior to the sermon this morning, um, children aged three and up to those in grade six will be invited to the Sunday school. Um, registration is required for your children to attend, and children under the age of six must be signed in and signed out by a parent. The children will also be singing a song in the afternoon service, which begins at 2 o'clock p.m. That's something we look forward to hearing. After our worship service this morning, lunch will be served. Now we'll be in the North Wing, like yesterday. Uh, everyone is invited, and we hope that you can stay and join us, and then that you can also stay for the remaining services today. There's another one at 2 o'clock p.m. and one at 6 o'clock p.m. We have many young people here from all across Canada and possibly some from outside of Canada here, and they are all invited to sing along in a song during the service this afternoon. Um, so this mass youth choir will practice at 1 o'clock p.m. today. So young people, make a note, 1 o'clock p.m. to be here at the front of the sanctuary for a practice. At a church conference like this, we have the privilege of being able to pray for one another together for needs, but also to be anointed for healing by the pastor brothers. If you have a need on your heart, or you have a prayer request to share, or if you have faith to be anointed for healing, you are invited to do so after the 2 o'clock p.m. service this afternoon at the front here in the sanctuary. And lastly, if you'd like to find out more about the Edmonton Church of God, you are invited to join us for a welcome session on Sunday, October 15th, after the worship service. At this session, um, we'll provide an overview of our church family, programming, and opportunities to get involved. Um, a brief presentation will be followed by a question and answer and a meet and greet with our pastors and some of the leaders in the congregation. Please register at the Welcome Center on our website or on the church app by September 24th. That is it for our announcements. We are going to hear a song now from the Edmonton Worship Choir. And it's the song, Thou, O Lord. It's another one of those songs that is based directly on Scripture. And this is based on Psalm 3. The choir, please.
We're going to read a short passage of scripture together now. And it is from Paul's letter to Titus. We'll be reading right from the beginning, Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Here Paul writes, Paul, a bondservant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior, to Titus a true son in our common faith. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. That is the word of God. We want to come before him now in prayer and ask him for the blessing. Where possible, let's stand and bow our heads now as we ask in prayer. Father in heaven, and our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and our hope. We truly are among the most privileged of all people on earth to be gathered like this as your children, saved by your precious blood, Lord Jesus, made new through your Holy Spirit, that we can gather in your name to worship you, to draw close to you, to experience your wonderful holy presence and be reminded of these wonderful truths that you truly are our hope, a hope that is unshakable, that cannot be lost as long as we are in you and you're in your presence, Lord. And we know that you love us more than we can even grasp. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for the blessings we already experienced yesterday, Lord, being reminded that you are a God that cannot lie and that every one of your promises will hold true. And therefore, we have this anchor of the soul, this hope in you, Lord Jesus. And Father, today, once again, we are looking up to you, asking that you would give us what we need that you would speak to our souls, that you would work in our hearts, Lord, and that we would leave here changed. Father, you know exactly what everyone is going through, what every heart is like before you. We just pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would have something to say to each one of us. 
We also ask especially for the anointing of your Holy Spirit on Pastor Taryn as he shares your word today, Lord, that it would be you speaking through him and that we would have ears to hear, Lord. We ask for your blessing on everything that is done. We thank you so much that we can pray this in faith that you have heard us, that you want to answer these prayers, and that you are going to speak and move in wonderful ways. We love you, Lord. We praise your holy name. You deserve all honor and glory and worship forever. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We're going to hear a song now from the Steinbeck Youth Choir.
Thank you so much, Youth Choir, for that incredible reminder. Sometimes when we go through difficulties, it seems we just wonder, why does it have to be so hard? But when we picture this, this moment, when we see Jesus face to face, just try to picture that moment, what that will be like when we see Jesus in all his glory. It will be so worth it. <laughs> the struggles of this world cannot compare to what God has awaiting us. Praise God for that truth. We're going to join once more together in worshiping God by singing. As we sing the first song, the children ages three up to those in grade six are invited to head to the exits to my right here to go to Sunday school. And those that are uh, three to six years old need to be signed in by their parents and guardians. After the children have headed out, we will have the first opportunity of this conference to give a free will offering or donation to the Lord. And during this conference, half of all the donations will go towards the mission project in Bolivia, but which we will find out a bit more and see a little presentation about this afternoon. And the other half will be towards the work of the local congregation here. So let's sing together.
May God bless every generous heart. Let's quiet our heart now and listen to what God has to say to us. Pastor Tern, who is the pastor in in the Church of God in Steinbeck, Manitoba, is going to come now and share God's word with us. What a joy it is to be together for another church conference. I was just thinking about it before. I haven't counted them, but for me, it's upwards of 50 church conferences that I've been here in Edmonton. And what a powerful impact they've had in my life. And I think for many of you who grew up here or attended conferences in past years. It may have been also the time where you found the Lord, where God was speaking in powerful ways and the Holy Spirit convicted us of sin and drew us to him so that we could seek Christ as our hope and our Savior. And that was the case for me also. I just remember it so clearly when God was speaking to my heart and drawing me, and I knew I have to go. I came forward, bowed, and someone came and prayed with me and received forgiveness and salvation and changed my life so that I have this joy and this privilege of being a child of God and walking with this living hope that we've heard about yesterday already Jesus Christ, imagine that getting to walk with the King of kings and Lord of lords, the almighty God and creator, and saying, I am yours and you are mine, and having this wonderful living relationship. And I'm so thankful to the Lord for that. And I pray that those blessings continue here in this congregation and in other places until the Lord returns and takes us home to be with him. And may many seek and find him as the hope of their life. We live in a world of turmoil, and I don't know if you talk to anyone that says, boy, things are sure getting brighter out there. The world is turning into a better place day by day. It seems to be exactly the opposite. And the more that happens, the more desperate people are becoming and grasping often at straws and looking for something to hold on to. And praise God, we have something. We have someone, our great God himself, Jesus Christ, our hope. Life goes by so quickly, it's hard to believe when I think back to those teen years here in the congregation in Edmonton, I'm a grandpa, soon to be a senior citizen if I live that long, and you say, where has life gone? And so quickly, the end of time is approaching and eternity begins. And it's something that none of us can evade. We're all going that way into eternity. And how wonderful it is that we have Christ as our hope of eternal life. You see, we all end up in one of two places. In heaven with Christ, living eternally, or in hell with Satan and his demons, in eternal torture. Those are the realities. That is the reality. Those are the two choices. And everyone will be in one of those places. And how wonderful to have Christ as our hope, not just in this life, but for all 
eternity. As I was praying about God's word for this conference, and this actually goes back, I think, to the beginning of summer when Pastor Krebs asked me to also share the word here that God at that time laid something on my heart about laying hold on eternal life. And I'd like to read a text from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 12. And here Paul is writing to this young pastor, Timothy, and he says these words, But you, O man of God, flee these things, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. But you, O man of God, Timothy, at one point, he calls him my own son in the gospel. If I could just lay this onto your heart, if I could somehow write it into your heart, these words, fight the good fight of faith, and whatever you do, lay hold on eternal life. In another place, The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, and I don't have that screen here. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men the most pitiable. You ever thought of that? Having the hope of Christ in this life is better than anything else out there. But if it was just for this life, he says, we were to be pitied. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In terms of eternal life, without Jesus Christ, we have no hope. Man has tried to find many ways to God. Philosophers have talked about this mountain that you can climb and you can approach it from different sides and in different ways and in the name of different religions and whatever the case may be. And as they say, all roads lead to Rome. There's many ways to reach the top of the mountain, get to God. No, there aren't. There's that great cliff, that chasm between man and God that was caused by sin And only in Jesus Christ can we bridge that gap and find our way back to God and have our souls restored. Without Jesus Christ, we have no hope of eternal life. And if our God or our hope in our wonderful God and Savior was only for the short time of this life, in the end... What would it help? Yes, we'd have some benefit, but we would truly be bereft of hope. I've spoken with many older people in these days. My parents are in a situation where old age is really impacting them, and it's hard to see. And so often we've said, if we wouldn't have this hope, that the best is yet to come, that soon we will be with Jesus, our Savior. If we wouldn't have that hope, what would we do when you're faced with death, when you've lost a loved one, when everything in this life falls apart and seems to have no meaning anymore? We have this living hope When I step into eternity, Jesus will be waiting there. The hope of eternal life. 
And all of us are being drawn irrevocably towards that moment when we will stand before God. And I know that none of us will remain standing there. We will be down on our faces before him in his holy presence. And yet, it's the greatest moment for God's people that we get to look forward to. The realization of our hope of eternal life. God's word tells us, it's in Romans 3, uh, 623, or 323, sorry, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. It's our only hope of making it to heaven. Our only hope of eternal life is Jesus Christ as the Savior of our souls to deal with that sin that we've all fallen into. God's Word also tells us, and that is in Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the gift to all who desire it, to all who want, to all who come, to all who will ask Him, to all who will open their hearts to Him, the gift of eternal life, the gift of God is eternal life. And that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And may I say to you this morning, if you haven't experienced that, then my friend, lay hold on eternal life. Jesus Christ is your only hope. And it is this hope of eternal life in Christ our Lord that makes everything, every struggle that we face, every trial, every discouragement, and all suffering worthwhile. Our young people sang here, it will be worth it all. Sometimes this life is tough, even for God's people. And everyone has their burden to bear, their struggles, their trials, but it will be worth it all in that first moment when we see Jesus, our hope of eternal life. At the end of it all, we will be with Christ forever and ever. But we're not there yet. And maybe some of you haven't even started on that way yet. Maybe you're not on that narrow path that leads to eternal life. We're still here in this life, and we still have a battle to fight, a spiritual battle, heading towards that moment when God will call us. And so the Apostle Paul says these words here to Timothy, but you, O man of God, flee all these other things, fight the good fight of faith, and lay hold on eternal life. And if we stop and think about this for a moment, what was Paul trying to say to Timothy? It begins with these words, but you, O man of God. Here's a pastor who obviously is working under the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul, also inspired by the Holy Spirit, is saying to him, you man of God, lay hold on eternal life. Didn't he have that assurance? Wasn't he really a Christian? Was there something missing in his life? But Paul was trying to urge him to keep his focus on what's most important. Not to get hung up in all sorts of other things, but shall I say with both hands to just grab on to hold on with all that was within him to this assurance of eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. If we read the context of our text here and this passage, 
There are three things that Paul is telling Timothy to do. You, O man of God, the first thing he says is flee. Flee these things, we read, and we'll get into a little bit more detail in a moment here. Then he says pursue and fight. Let's look at them briefly, and I hope I don't spend too much time here. Man of God, flee these things, and I think I'm missing a screen that I wanted here. Okay, let me go back. What is Paul talking about? Well, anything that distracts and takes the focus off Christ, our living hope. Those may not be things that are bad in and of themselves. They may not be things that are sinful in and of themselves. But if there is anything in your life that you notice that is taking priority, that is holding you back, not just from serving in the kingdom of God, but somehow keeping you back from a relationship with Christ, taking the place of your first love in Christ, or whatever it is, anything that distracts us from Jesus, our living hope. O man of God, O woman of God, flee these things. Yesterday, as we were sitting at the table after a fine meal here, and just talking with brothers and sisters there, we got to reminiscing, speaking with some old friends, and something came to my mind that I shared with with the people there at the table. When I was a young man, I loved to play golf. And as far as I can see, there's nothing spiritually wrong with taking a piece of iron and hitting a ball with it. But there was a time when this became so important to me that one Sunday during a sermon, the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, you're out there in the evenings when it's dark already trying to find this golf ball. You're, when you have nothing to do at work, taking some time meeting friends on the golf course, you're doing this, you're doing that, and golf is taking over your life. And it's standing in your way. I need you to give it up. And... uh, God showed me very clearly that this was going to hold me back from serving him. Please understand me. I'm not saying playing golf is sinful. It may not be wrong for you. But if it takes such an important part of your life, if it becomes so important that it, in effect, becomes an idol, then, O man of God, and O woman of God, Whatever it is in your life, lay hold on eternal life and not on those things. That's what Paul is talking about here. He gives a specific example, and we have that here in in our uh, text in in 1 Timothy 6, verse 9. And, uh, well, let me start with verse 8. I don't have it on the screen here. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich, they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Notice that Paul does not say money is evil. If you have it, praise God. Use it for his glory. But he talks for, about the love of money. And in their greediness, it's taking control of their lives. And if it's your business, and if it's your, your home or your family or your farm or whatever it may be, your sports your hobbies, someone else in your life, 
if this is taking the place of God that God should have and becoming an idol in your life, don't let it destroy you. Lay hold on eternal life and release those things that stand in God's way and keep, can keep you back from making it to heaven. You see, it says here that, I'll go back a verse here, have fallen into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. It's possible to fall into these things that will drown us and destroy us and will end up in perdition. There's so many people putting their hopes in wealth, in technology, in medical advancements, even in science fiction. I just remember years ago, many years ago, being in a museum, there was a section where they had these cryogenic vaults where very wealthy people could pay, I don't know, several million dollars, have their bodies frozen, in the hope that sometime in the future, me uh, medical uh, science would find a cure for whatever disease or sickness they had, then thaw them, do whatever procedure needed to be done, and then revive them back to life here again. Well, they're putting their hopes in humankind, in technology, in money, in whatever, trying to gain eternal life. But you, O man of God, you, O woman of God, lay hold on eternal life, and eternal life is only possible in Jesus Christ. He is our only hope of eternal life. And Paul says, flee these things. Flee all of these things, anything that's going to stand in your way, anything that's going to hold your back, you back, anything that's going to disrupt your relationship with Jesus. Flee. He doesn't just say, you know what, be careful. Maybe you should be a little bit more moderate and cut back a little bit. If you notice that it's impacting your soul and keeping you from Christ, flee. Run as fast as you can and run to Jesus. And lay your life down at his altar of sacrifice. Give it to him. Flee these things, and, O oh man of God, pursue. That's the second thought that we have in our text here. But you, O oh man of God, flee these things and pursue. And then he gives a list here. Pursue righteousness. Well, righteousness is doing what's right before God. Living a life that pleases God, but doing right in and of itself can't save us. Jesus is our only hope of salvation. But, O oh man of God, live a righteous life by the power of Christ that's in us. We will stand before God and give account for what we have done here in this life and in this flesh. And we need to live holy lives in order to stand before God. And that is only possible by God's grace working in our lives. O man of God, pursue righteousness. And that righteousness that stands before God, that is acceptable before God, is only found in Jesus Christ. We can only be righteous before God if our sins are forgiven. If our hearts are cleansed of all sin and purified by the precious blood of Jesus our Savior. Only in what Christ did for us on Calvary will we find salvation. Can we be made righteous before God? See, Isaiah says that our righteousness, the best that a human being can produce, is like filthy rags before God. You know, people like to think they're pretty good. Christians like to think they're pretty good. 
sometimes a little bit better than those people out there. But how does God see all of that? What is my righteousness, my righteousness like before God? The word tells us like a filthy rag. You know, this stinky thing that you got out of the gutter and you can't even stand to have it in your presence. Nowadays, we'd be donning those blue gloves and, and plugging our nose, and that's our righteousness. Pursue the righteousness that is in salvation in Jesus Christ. The only hope we have to be righteous before God is to be redeemed and renewed by Christ Jesus our Lord, and then we can do right, and then we can live holy lives that please him and that will stand before him. Pursue righteousness and pursue godliness. Now that sounds like a pretty tall order. Godliness. Have you ever heard anyone describe themselves as, I'm a godly person? Well, I hope you don't try to do that. But that is what God wants from us, to imitate him. Godliness is living and acting and having the heart attitude of Jesus Christ. You'll never go wrong when you live and you love and you serve like Jesus did. We take him as our example. Pursue godliness, O man of God. Pursue righteousness and godliness. And the next thing that he says here is faith. A living, life-changing faith that clings to God's word and his promises. A faith that results in this living hope. I know that I will be there with him one day by his grace. Assurance of eternal life. Pursue love. And I don't know what to do with this topic this morning. Because as I was pondering it last night and this morning, I was just thinking, well... I'd probably be speaking here for hours when it comes to talking about what love means in our service of God. And let me just constrain it to one thing. Well, maybe two. That love of God needs to be poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It needs to be there. It needs to be the driving, motivating, motivating, defining force in our life as believers, as followers of Christ. It needs to be the definition of who we are in Christ. But the second thing I'd like to say is about love, our first love needs to belong to God. And in effect, I've already said that here a few minutes ago. But when Paul says here, O man of God, O woman of God, pursue. Pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and pursue love. That is, in terms of laying hold on eternal life, make sure that you love the Lord your God more than anything and that there is a burning, living love in your heart every day that defines how you are living, what you are doing, what you are saying, how you are acting, how you are serving, where you're going, where you're not going. Because if you really love someone more than anything else, that person will be central in your life. You will desire them you will love to be with them. You will love to spend time. And every facet, everything in your life will go through this filter. Do I love the Lord my God with all my strength, with all my mind, with all my soul, with everything that was within me? And if I take another gospel and add it, with all my resources, with everything in my life, The Lord Jesus, in his letter to the churches at Ephesus, had a long list of marvelous qualities. Really something that we could all uh, strive to attain. But then it came to the love. 
I have one thing. You've lost your first love. That first love. That he is truly above everything else. And he says, if you've lost that, you may have everything else. All of this wisdom and discernment and all of those things that you've worked and you've not grown weary and you're laboring and you're doing all these things. But if there's something that's not by what you say, but by your actions and where you spend your time and what your life really revolves around, if there's something other than Jesus Christ, the Lord says, repent. Repent and do the first works. It's got to get back to that point where we would say, Lord, everything and anything. You have to have the first place. And not just with my lips, but in reality, this has to be the truth. That I love you more than anything. Brother and sister, my friend, can you say that this morning? By the grace of God, yes. Yes, Jesus, you know I love you, as Peter said. Oh, man of God. Oh, woman of God, pursue love. This love to him that has to transcend everything in your life. And quickly now, patience and gentleness. You know, laying hold on eternal life means overcoming trials and tests and difficulties and difficult people and anger and spite and revenge and many other negative characteristics. And those truly living for eternity will be characterized by patience and gentleness. O man of God, lay hold of these things. Now, of course, some of us will have it much easier in these regards than others. But it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, lay hold on eternal life. And then he says, fight the good fight of faith. That tells us that there can be a fight of faith that is not a good one, that falters along the way, that relies on other things, but the faith in God. Our spiritual battle will be an ongoing one until we reach the gates of heaven. We will continue battling for our souls. Now, Christ will work in us, and Paul writes to the Philippians that he who has begun the good work in you will also fulfill it unto the day of Jesus Christ. The Lord will help us, but we will be in this spiritual battle. Fight the good fight of faith. And Paul is urging Timothy here to fight well and to finish well. You know, maybe you've started serving the Lord and somewhere along the way have lost it, have lost the way. Life has just gotten too hard. You've gotten disillusioned. People have disappointed you. And all sorts of things have happened. And that burning faith, along with the love, have somehow faded away. You're going through the motions O oh, man of God, fight the good fight of faith. Fighting a mediocre fight of faith or a bad fight of faith will not get us to heaven. But fighting a good fight in faith and in God's grace will assure us of eternal life. Lay hold, O oh, man of God, O oh, woman of God, on eternal life. These words come straight from Paul's heart to that young man of God, Timothy, whom he loved so much. Let's read on a little bit here, verse 13 and 14. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, 
blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. O man of God, lay hold on eternal life and fight this good fight of faith. Paul is literally pleading with Timothy to do whatever it takes to have the right to eternal life when he reaches his eternal destiny. And how about you? Do you have that assurance of eternal life today? We need to know that everything is right between us and our God. If there's any sin that has come into your life that stands between you and Him, that hasn't been brought under the cross, that isn't forgiven, may I urge you this morning to lay hold on eternal life. Do you have this strong and living faith, this living hope in Jesus Christ, our Savior? Are you in bondage to sin? You know, it's a sign of our times that this scourge of pornography and other sins, addictions, are just keeping people in bondage. They're struggling and struggling and struggling. Listen, Jesus Christ is our hope. Our hope for this life, our hope of salvation, our hope of finally getting free of all of these things. And if you're in bondage to sin, you're not on the path to eternal life. You need to be forgiven and freed from that sin. Your heart purified by the blood of Jesus and set free by the power of that blood. And I'm here today to tell you that there is power in the blood of Jesus, in the salvation that Jesus wrought on Calvary as he died there on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, but to set us free from sin, there is power to free from any bondage. And if Satan has managed to rob you of all hope and said, this works for others, but not for you, You've tried so many times and you just end up failing again and again and again. You're just a big hypocrite. There's no hope for you. Then I want you to say one thing to him. You are a liar because Satan will always lie. There is power in the blood of Jesus to set free from any bondage. And if you are in bondage to sin or addictions or anything that is keeping you from Christ, I want to say to you, my friend, whoever you are, lay hold on eternal life. Everything depends on it. We need to have that salvation in Jesus, that living hope before we step into eternity. And you all know that we have no guarantee beyond right now. lay hold on eternal life are you living for eternity have you laid hold on eternal life or are there things still holding you back we heard a very important testimony yesterday about forgiving and we know that our Lord said that if we are not willing to forgive others then God will not forgive our trespasses. Is there some bitterness in your heart against someone who has wronged you, who has hurt you, and these things are festering in there? I remember a sister coming to a pastor brother whom I was working with and saying, you know what, I've carried this burden for, for 50 years. And it was something terrible that had been done to her. Sexual abuse. And it defines the whole life and robs of joy. And there's always this waiting, and, and waiting down and just destroying everything about life. Bring those things to Jesus. Let go of them. 
and where someone has hurt you so badly, it's obvious they did wrong. But if you don't let go of it, my friend, who's going to lose out? And I want to say to you this morning, lay hold on eternal life. Forgive that person and just let God deal with it. He will have a righteous judgment on that day. And it's not yours to worry about. A brother once said to me, you know, someone had hurt him so badly and wronged him. And he couldn't let go of this. And then God spoke to him once and he said, you know what? That person may have already repented. It happened years ago. And if he's repented and I've forgiven him, he will be in heaven. And you, who are the one who is the righteous one, the good one, if you don't forgive, you don't let go, then that will stand between you and me. Now, I'm just going to say something that is in very general terms. You've just had a building project here. Before that, we built onto our church in Steinbeck. And I could hardly believe it, but years afterwards, there were still things that were festering. You know, you have committees, you have ideas, you go in certain directions, things happen, someone steps on someone's toes, someone says something and it gets taken the wrong way and it hurts and all of these things. People leave the church, people do all sorts of things, can't look at each other. I hope that's not the case here in Edmonton. Sadly, it is the case where there's many building projects and if that should be the case here, my friend, what does it help? Forgive, let go of these things. In many cases, I found this in the ministry, things aren't as they seem. I truly don't believe that there's anyone here that goes out of their way to step on someone else, to willingly hurt them. You know, I'm just going to, I've got the opportunity, I'm just going to give them one now. There's always two sides to every story. There were misunderstandings, there's this, there's that. But my friend, if you are being held back from eternal life because of this, you need to bring it to the cross and ask God to forgive you and forgive your brother or sister, whoever it is. And if you've wronged someone and you're too embarrassed to go admit it, and you're trying to justify it, and you're trying to find ways around it, whatever it may be, listen, my friend, you go and make that right before God and with anyone who maybe you've hurt or wronged. Oh, man of God, oh, woman of God, whatever it is that is, that is holding you back, if there's something standing between your brother and your, or your sister and you, Get it out of the way. It's standing between you and eternal life. And if your life is filled with many, many distractions of this world and they've slowly, slowly gained inroads and have become more important than the kingdom of God and serving the Lord and loving the Lord, whatever it is, I want to say to you this morning, lay hold on eternal life because we're all heading there so quickly. And how will you stand before God? Because Jesus Christ, our hope, will also be our judge. And then he will judge. And only if we are standing before him with hearts that have been cleansed and purified by his blood. What did the Lord say in Matthew in chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, verse 7? Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God so if there's anything standing between you and the Lord between you and a brother or sister this morning whatever it may be or if you've never 
repented of your sin and turned to Christ and sought his forgiveness and salvation, then I want to urge you this morning, give your life to Jesus. Ask him to save you. Or if you've been, been considered a man of God, a follower of Christ for many years, and you know deep down in your heart, it's not right. There's something between me and God. I would just beg you. Just beg you. Don't wait another day. Lay hold on eternal life. We're going to give an opportunity this morning that if you want to seek the Lord, you can come forward. Kneel down here. I'm not exactly sure how to make this work, but let me say it this way. There's a lot of room over here in these first pews. If you'd like a pastor to come and pray with you, to help you, maybe you've struggled. You've come to the Lord repeatedly, and you're just not getting the victory. Why don't you come and kneel down here in one of these chairs? If you want to just come forward and pray here, and we'll offer a prayer for everyone, you can come and kneel on this side. But if the Lord is speaking to your heart and urging you this morning, my friend, lay hold on eternal life. The opportunity is there. Jesus is inviting, come to me, all you who are heavenly laden and burdened and laboring and trying and struggling and beating yourself up and all of these things. Why don't you come? And he says, I will give you rest. And whosoever desires, let him come and take of the water of life freely. And so we're going to sing a song together, song number 192 in our hymnals. And we'll give that invitation. If you want to seek the Lord this morning, if you want to lay hold on eternal life that he's offering you, why don't you come? And you'll find what you need in the Lord. Lord, take the first place in my life, in my heart. We're going to sing that. Can I ask you to stand, please? And we'll give the invitation. You can come forward. the Spirit of God speaks to us and says, my child, won't you come to me and receive life, receive forgiveness? There's another voice that works also and says, don't go. Not now. Not in front of all those people. You can fix this on your own. You'll do a little bit better Try a bit harder, and it'll all be good. Or, you know, you're just quite a bit better than all of those so-called Christians out there. They need to clean up their act first. Or that person that has wronged you there, they need to go and make things right before God, much before you do. 
Listen, if God is speaking to you, don't listen to anything else. Don't look at anyone else. Don't say, you know, that person needs to go or that person should go. Say, Lord, I'm coming. Would you take the first place in my heart? If he hasn't truly ha had that first place, no matter what it is, my friend, whatever it is that's holding you back from him, come, let him take the first place. And you'll leave here full of the joy and that living hope, Jesus Christ. Let's sing, O oh, come, gentle spirit. What is eternal life worth to you? Does it matter what others think? Does it matter what others do? What matters is that you willingly say, Lord, that's enough. I'm coming now. I want you to truly take first place. And I'll give up everything else just to have you. I need you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. You need to have first place. You've got to be my all. Why don't you come if the Lord has spoken to you? We're going to pray together. We'll hear some announcements yet, and we'll sing the final stanza. And we invite you to come to Christ, our only hope. Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, Thank you that you love us so much that you were willing to give up heaven for us, to come to suffer and die for our sins. Lord, you took our place there on the cross in our sins and our transgressions and our punishment was laid on you. The price is paid, Lord, mm -hmm. so that everyone in the world could have eternal life and be with you in heaven forever. And Lord, here we are this morning, and we've heard your word, and we know that you are inviting us to come and to lay hold on eternal life. And I beg you, Jesus, I pray that you would just draw by your Holy Spirit so powerfully that every soul here yes. that doesn't have that assurance of eternal life would just say, Lord, I need that more than anything, and I, I'm coming. Take first place. 
Don't let anyone go out, Lord, and be lost. You've given us these wonderful opportunities, Lord, to experience you, to be set free, to serve you, to love you, to walk with you, and then to rejoice, Lord, to see you forever and to be with you forever. And so I plead with you, Lord, that by your power, the power of your Holy Spirit, you would overcome all opposition. Yes. We want to bind the power of the enemy by your holy blood, O oh Lord. And we just pray that you would do a great work in many hearts. Lord, as we will leave this place, we pray that you would bless the balance of the day, keep speaking to us. Let our assemblies here, Lord, be acceptable before you and give the working of your Holy Spirit. Thank you also for the food that's been prepared for the nourishment of our bodies, Lord. We just want to give you praise for all those who have worked so lovingly and bless everything that is done. And Lord, we just love you. We want to thank you. We want to serve you yes. with all that's within us. Help us to do so. Yes. And that we, as men and women of God, would lay hold on eternal life. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. In your holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Just a few things to share before we sing the last verse. And that's parents of children ages three to six, please remember to go and sign out your children from Sunday school. Then there's a reminder for our young people. There is a choir practice here at one o'clock p.m. Please make sure to be there. Then for the meal that is prepared, um, please line up here in the north hallway to receive the meal. It will be served a face style. Seating is available in the fellowship hall and our ushers will be happy to direct you to a free seat. There are gluten-free options available and our hospitality team will do their best to meet special dietary needs. After the meal, please exit on this side in the fellowship hall via the children's wing to the south. Um, if you're not physically able to stand in line or if you need assistance, um, please make your way to the multi-purpose room where our volunteers will be happy to serve you. But if you are here and you're not right with God, don't think about the meal. Amen. <laughs> Come, kneel down and lay hold of eternal life and you will never regret it. But if you ignore God's voice, you may regret it forever. This is the opportunity. Please come as we sing the last verse now. <laughs>